I had always been aware of the deep web. You hear the craziest, most messed up stories from people who have the balls to explore it. Websites that involve human experimentation, hiring a hitman, and even watching people through their own security cameras. It's messed up. But honestly, I'd be lying if I said I wasn't just slightly interested. Now, just to point out, there was no malicious intent behind my exploration of the deep web. I was just curious to see if it really was as bad as people said it was. The first thing I stumbled upon was a website extremely centered around death, which gave me a really uneasy feeling, so I didn't hang around that webpage very long. It takes quite a bit to freak me out, so it's safe to say I was a little surprised that I couldn't even stomach the first website I clicked on. But hey, it's not supposed to be all unicorns and rainbows, right? Next, I clicked a website that was dedicated to watching people through security cameras. Most of the screens showed empty living rooms and patios. Some of them showed oddly filled rooms like rooms that were packed with stuffed animals, and another that was eerily decorated with Christmas lights and fake Santa Claus statues. Another screen showed a young woman doing yoga, that one had a lot of views. I didn't watch that one very long. Something inside me felt ill and just wrong like what I was doing was sickening. I shook my head, blinking away any more curiosity before I hovered my mouse over the tiny X to close the window. Right before I pressed the mouse, I saw a blue link under a black screen that said, Proceed with caution. I bit down on my back teeth, yelling internally to leave the page, Don't click the link, it's not worth it. It could be murder, would that make me an accomplice? What if it was someone skinning an animal or some shit like that? But then again, what if it wasn't? I don't know what the hell propelled me to move my mouse away from the window, hovering it over the link instead, but that's where I ended up. My curiosity always got the best of me, and no matter how twisted my stomach felt, or how strong the feeling of dread was that lingered right over my head, I had to know. I really just had to know what the link led to, or I would go crazy until I finally figured it out. So I pressed my mouse down and watched the link turn purple, felt my mouth go dry, and watched as the screen slowly loaded. The page was just compromised of a large screen, like the security camera page, only it was just one. The room was concrete, it was dark. There must have been a night vision camera or something, because everything had a weird blue-green tinge, but you could tell there was little to no light. There was a dark liquid on the floor in a medium-sized puddle. I told myself it was gasoline, don't ask me why. Movement in the far right of the screen caught my attention, and I immediately perked in my desk chair, inching my face closer to the screen of my laptop. It looked like an arm like someone's forearm. They were standing there, not really moving but subtly swaying, just enough to not look completely still. Hey, I said, before shaking my head and slapping my mouth shut. Stupid. Then, the person walked, they walked over towards the left of the screen. I felt my stomach knot, felt my throat tingle and tighten, bile rising in the back of my throat. I knew my mouth was open, gaping and my eyes were wide, face screwed up into an expression of pure disgust. It was a young woman, she looked like she couldn't be older than twenty-five or so. Long, dark and dirty hair was in tangles like she'd been pulling at it. Her leg was dragging her other skinny leg doing most of the work as she limped weakly. Her head was down, looking at the floor, and the sound of her dragging her foot across the concrete echoed in my silent room. I didn't think it could get any worse. I was so, so wrong. Suddenly, the woman raised her head, and it looked like it weighed a ton on her tiny body. I hadn't noticed it before, only able to barely make out her side profile, but now it was clear as day. She looked around, eyes watering with tears and black makeup streaming down her face. Small strands of bloody thread were intertwined in her lips, messily tied, locking them together. Dark blood stained her chin, probably from where she tried desperately to open her mouth to scream before realizing she couldn't. Her dainty fingers were stained as well, the same color as the puddle on the concrete. My whole body felt weak. My stomach was sick. I tried to tell myself it was fake, that it was all a big hoax. My eyes scanned to the bottom left of the screen. Five, six hundred twenty-three. Five thousand six hundred and twenty-three people were watching. Unable to fight it any longer, I ran straight into the bathroom, puking my insides into the toilet bowl. Everything in me felt disgusting. Wrong. Twisted. 
Once I was finally done, I laid on the floor of the bathroom, letting the cool tiles try to soothe my burning body. My head was spinning. I kept repeating to myself, over and over in my head, that I shouldn't have clicked the link, I should have left, I should have closed the window and told my inner curiosity to go F itself. Instead, I was laying on the floor, the bathroom reeking of vomit, and my mind a complete mess over that the hell I was supposed to do. Should I get the link and send it to the police? Should I call them now? My first instinct was to copy and paste the link, just in case, then call the police and inform them of what was happening. Maybe they could trace the IP address or something. Maybe they would recognize the girl and know where to start looking. Maybe I could save her life. I'd feel really dumb if this was all fake just to get viewers, but I wasn't about to gamble. Not with what was at stake. I ignored the dizzy feeling flooding my head as I jumped up, grabbing the doorknob and twisting it a bit too harshly. When I flung the door open, my phone buzzed in my pocket, scaring the living shit out of me. I stopped mid-panic and picked it up with shaky hands. I saw my girlfriend's name and immediately slid to answer. My voice was a complete wreck my eyes finding the screen where the girl shrunk down to the ground, the sound of her cries bouncing around the room, making my body feel rigid. I had nothing left to throw up, but I still felt so sick. Madeline, you're not going to believe what I just saw. What? You are you okay? Have you been crying? No, I'm not okay, I answered, averting my eyes from the screen. I know you said to stay away from the deep web, but... Are you kidding me? Her voice went from caring to mad in a split second. I told you to stay away from that place. You never listen to me. You never do. There's a girl. I said weakly. She's trapped in some basement or something. Her mouth is. She's... Her mouth is like sewn shut. There's blood all over her face and hands. I don't know what to do, Madeline. The woman's cries got louder, more desperate, but muffled. I'm so sorry. Close it out. Clear your history, and never go back there again. I'm not kidding. But, should I call? No, her voice was stern now. You don't know if it's bullshit. It's probably staged to gain disgusting viewers, apparently like yourself. People do it all the time. That's why I said it'd be best if you just stayed away from there. You could get yourself into a lot of trouble. I didn't say anything, wordlessly walking over to the desk. My hand shook as I raised my mouse to the small X once more. My eyes watched the number of viewers slowly tick higher and higher before I closed the window. I felt even worse than before. Okay. We can file a report tomorrow, just in case. But for now, go to sleep and stay the F away. I can't believe you even went there in the first place. I didn't have the energy to argue with her. Guilt plagued my whole body, drowning me. It was all I could feel. I told her good night, that I was sorry, and that I loved her before I hung up and made my way to the couch to sleep. Or try to sleep. It didn't feel right even being in my bedroom, or being anywhere near my computer. Not while that girl was still trapped, unable to scream for help, unable to talk at all. I know it could be fake, but was that really a risk I was willing to take? I looked up some Google searches over what was fake on the deep web and read multiple stories about staged webcam videos, which made me feel a little bit better. It didn't make the sick, guilty feeling go away, though. It's safe to say that I didn't get much sleep. Every time I closed my eyes or even began to drift off, I would see the woman's face, the thread laced into her lips, the blood staining her mouth, her fingers, the floor. I continued to grow more and more anxious and uneasy, deciding that maybe getting out of the house Heading over to the local CVS and picking up some melatonin might help. I threw my blanket off, slid on my shoes and grabbed my keys and wallet from the nightstand. The cool air felt amazing, and did wonders to calm to whirlwind of thoughts in my head. I went to check the time, realizing I'd left my phone at home. Not a huge deal, the store was only a few minutes away from my house. I ended up buying melatonin and a stronger sleeping pill just in case those didn't work. I also got a pack of bottled water to help rehydrate after I vomited up all the contents in my stomach earlier. By the time I got home, I felt much, much better, which lasted about three seconds before I noticed that my front door was wide open. Now I may have been in a state of shock and panic, but I never, never ever leave my front door open or even unlocked. My heart immediately began to race. I got out of my car, 
closing the door quietly and unlocking my trunk, grabbing the crowbar that I keep in there. Who's there? I yelled into the house, waiting for any noise. Who is in there? My own voice was shaking and weak. I was met with complete silence. Keeping the crowbar up and ready to strike, I walked to the couch and felt for my phone. As soon as I found it, I hit the emergency button and waited until I got a hold of a 911 operator, letting her know that I think my house was just broken into. She told me police would be on their way. After checking around the house for anything odd, I decided to give my girlfriend a call, letting her know what happened. The phone rang, rang, and then rang some more. After getting her voicemail I hung up, knowing she'd probably be asleep this late at night. I waited about twenty or so minutes for the police to show up, and walked around with them like a scared puppy as they checked every room. They ended up just having me fill out a report telling me they'll keep patrol cars in the area just in case anyone else gets hit. As they were leaving, I checked to see if Madeline had called back yet, but there wasn't any missed calls. I however did notice several outgoing calls to her cell phone. Outgoing call to Madeline, 3.12 a.m. Outgoing call to Madeline, 3.14 a.m. Outgoing call to Madeline, 3.17 a.m. Outgoing call to Madeline, 3.20 a.m. And then another one at 3.56, which was around the time I'd gotten home. My mind went into an automatic panic, knowing for a fact that I did not make those calls. I quickly checked my texts, reading one I'd apparently sent out at 3.23 a.m. Hey, can't sleep. Gonna come over, mind leaving the back door unlocked so I can get in? I didn't send that message. My stomach dropped, my heart thudded loudly in my chest as I noticed her reply directly underneath. Sorry, I was sleeping. Thanks for waking me up, by the way. Lose your key again? It's unlocked, don't be too late. Without a second thought, I jumped up, running to lock all the doors and windows in my house, keeping the crowbar tight in my hand as I ran to my car. I drove as fast as my little Civic would allow all the way to her house, ignoring any stoplights. It only took me three minutes to get there, but I still knew it'd be too late. I made my way to her back door, feeling every cell in my body burn when I saw it was wide open. My face was hot, my hands were shaking, but I stepped in, crowbar raised like a bat, ready to swing. I tried to keep my emotions at bay as I looked around her dark house. Madeline, I called out, are you okay, babe? A small scream came from her bedroom just up the stairs. My legs jerked to a run as I flew up the stairs, slamming her door open. I looked at her empty bed, her empty room. Confused, I heard the scream again. Only this time, I heard that it was coming through her computer monitor. I felt numb as I looked at the screen, noticing the same website I saw earlier, only instead of one woman, I saw two. The first was lying on the floor, not moving, in that puddle of dark liquid. I recognized the second girl, just as I had recognized her voice. My heart shattered as I saw her face, streaked in blood. The same threading was sewn into her eyelids, locking them shut. Her scream hit my bones, surrounded my body. It was all I could hear. Her face was twisted in pure terror. I cried pathetically as her voice began to go out, continuing to grow weaker and rasped. I locked my jaw, picking up my cell and dialing 911 for the second time. Only this time it barely rang once before the deep, gravelly voice of another man answered, You should not have called. Chills shot down my body, and I heard the phone thud as it hit the carpeted floor. My breath hitched in my throat as I bent to pick it up, hanging up the call and racing down the stairs. How did he do that? How did he redirect my call away from the police? I felt my heart race as I darted out of her back door, in a frenzy as I sprinted to the closest house. I pounded the door, screaming at the top of my lungs until the neighbor opened it, her face tired, confused, and scared. She let me in, and I explained through frantic tears what happened. I'm typing this on my phone to post as we both try to get a hold of the cops, but neither of our calls are going through, and neither is her landline. I think someone is messing with our cellular signal, and they may have cut her line, but we're going to keep trying. I'm scared for me, I'm scared for my girlfriend, and I'm scared for my neighbor. I don't know what's going to happen to me. If you don't hear from me again, please take this advice and this experience to heart. Stay away from the deep web. For F's sake, please, please stay away from the deep web.
I ordered myself on the dark web. I know you're frowning. The title is weird, I know. But if you could just give me a moment, I'll explain. I'll have to be fast, though. I don't know how close they are. Essentially, I ordered myself on the dark web. I'm a drug user, I'll admit it. Weed is my usual go-to, but I buy that off my friend. If, however, I want to get something a little heavier, like acid or coke, I just order it off the dark web. It's surprisingly simple. A few clicks, some bitcoin transfers, and then boom, I have acid in my po' box. But I'm also a curious guy. The dark web has always intrigued me. Up until a few days ago, I had only been on there to buy drugs off sites some of my friends gave to me. But late one night I was sober and at home, which was a rare thing for me. So since I was bored I decided to boot up my Tor browser and try and see what sort of messed up shit I could find on the dark web. If you've ever been on the dark web, you'll know that you can't just search up Red Rooms or Hitman for Hire and get results. No, you have to find links to these websites first. So I hopped back onto Google again to try and find some links to a messed up website. I know it's weird that I was actively searching for the worst, but as soon as I got on the dark web that night I had a sense of morbid curiosity overcame me. Anyway, I spent a little while trying to find some links. Anything that I found though was either too tame for me, or the links didn't work. At this point, I was about ready to give up, and I wish I had. But in one final attempt, I clicked on Reddit. Hoping on to our deep web, I didn't think I would find anything. So I just scrolled through hot for about half an hour before sorting by new. Then I found it. One simple text post titled, Slayer's Assassination and Life Ruining Services. In the text box in the post was what seemed to be just a random assortment of numbers and letters xi 3 dkitcock 2 y 3 for those of you curious. It took my tired brain a second to figure out what it was, but I realized pretty quickly. It was a link, presumably to a Hitman website. So I decided to paste the link into my dark web browser, and what do you know it worked. But before I decided to go any further I figured I should go back to Ops Profile to see if they have posted any other dark web links. However, when I went back to the post in question Ops Profile was deleted. Weird. Anyway, I reopened my dark web tab and hopped onto the site. Up along the top of the website was its name, Slayer's Assassination and Life Ruining Services, and next to it, what looked to be a skull inside of a crosshair. I chuckled when I saw that, the site must be fake. Upon scrolling down, however, I was not disappointed. There was a paragraph of white text on a black background, and a small box to the right of the text that just said place in order. The text was the main part, though, as it took up most of the page. It read, Slayer's Assassinations and Life Ruining Services offers everything from acid attack, crippling, blinding, castration, torture, as assaults, beatings, and good old death. We have the lowest prices out of any other company running similar services, and we are worldwide. We have a dedicated and experienced group of staff based all over the world, so if you need someone to be assassinated, or maybe you just want them scarred for life, don't hesitate to contact us. Again I laughed. This had to be satire, right? Hell, I was even tempted to order it on someone just to see what would happen. Ironically, I actually have a half-decent job so I can afford to. Better not to risk it though, I thought to myself. I was about to close my computer and call it for a night when I heard a knock at the door. I live alone, so it was unusual to get visitors, especially so late at night. But when I opened my door it was just my good buddy Mark, who also happened to be my weed plug. As I opened the door, he didn't hesitate to let himself in and shove a big baggie full of pot in my face. This dude, if the best shit I've had in a minute, we gotta try some. I couldn't say no. Cut to a couple hours later, it's early morning and Mark and I are chilling on my couch, both blazed as F. He suddenly decides to get up, and I assume he's going to get some leftover pizza, but he walks over to my desk and computer. Slayer's assassinations, are you going to kill someone or something? He mutters. What? I reply. Your computer dude, it's got some hacker shit on it. It's the dark web man, don't F with it. At this point I'm still on my couch, half asleep and not paying full attention. However I sat up pretty fast when he said the words, Hey man, let's order a hitman on you. I hoped up and walked over to my PC, 
Part of my brain was screaming, no, what the F are you doing? But the majority of my brain, which was also the high part, was thinking about how funny it would be to order a hitman on myself. So I agree. I do made him get out my chair though, because I didn't want him seeing what my credit card numbers were as I transferred some Bitcoin. At the end, after I wrote down all my personal details, like my address, age, and even a photo, I had to select what I wanted to happen to me. I just selected plain old assassination, as it was actually cheaper than some of the other things. I could have paid an extra couple of grand to be beaten before my death, but even my high brain didn't want to splash the cash too much on my own death. God, this is ridiculous. Anyway, I placed the order and then replied to a confirmation email, and boom, it was done. A couple of clicks and I had ordered myself on the dark web. Mark and I laughed about it for a while, but then he left about an hour later, and I fell asleep not too long after. I woke up around 9 a.m., which meant I got at least six hours of sleep, even if it felt like I got three. I got up and out of bed, threw on some track pants and a cotton shirt, yes, I sleep naked, and brewed myself a coffee before sitting down to play some games and just enjoy my Sunday. You can imagine how shocked I was when I saw that I had ordered my death the previous night. Even though I thought the sight was bullshit, I still felt a pit open up in my stomach. Even when I'm high, I usually can make sensible decisions. I chuckled, not like I could remember it anyway, but I guess Mark's new shit really was good. I would assume a normal human being would do something else, but I was still kind of out of it from the night before so I just carried on with my day. I was a little more paranoid, sure, but as I said I just assumed it was bullshit. I even laughed at the email I got from the website saying that their hitman has been dispatched and was on its way. It was like ordering a package of Amazon. I was tempted to email back and ask for some day delivery. But I didn't need to ask because that's exactly what I got. I didn't see it arrive, but around the time I started to cook myself a shitty dinner, I noticed a blacked out sedan parked on the other side of the road from my house. I didn't live in a rural area, but there is a lot of trees and bushes between each of the houses on my street so I would be surprised if any other house saw the car except for mine. At this point, I was freaking out. What if the sight was real? Even though I'm a big guy, I was freaking out. I don't own any weapons, aside from a slightly larger than average kitchen knife. F it, I'm confronting it, I decided. I put on a hoodie and slid the knife into the front pocket before waltzing on out of my house and walking right up to the driver's side window of the vehicle. Even I was astonished at my own courage. Knocking on the window, nothing happened. It was. Rather anticlimactic, I was fully prepared to have to fight for my life. All because I did something really dumb while I was baked. But, like I said, nothing happened. I even put my head right up to the window, as if there was a reflection, to try and get a better look to see what's inside. I could barely see what was inside of the car. But all I could make out were two empty seats. No one was even inside. I had got all hyped up for nothing. I decided to wait out by the car for a bit, but after half an hour or so I was hungry and I had to go back inside to take my dinner out of the oven. I swear it was only a minute between me going inside to take my dinner out of the oven and looking back out of the window and the car being gone. I didn't even hear it go. Guess I'm eating my dinner with all my curtains closed and doors locked, I muttered to myself. I had just started to calm down when the power shut off. It was sunny outside, and coupled with the car I now knew that this was the real deal. I had signed my own death warrant. I ran into my upstairs bedroom and locked the door, and then hid under the bed. I couldn't all the cops, what would I say? Oh yes, hello sir, turns out while super high I paid 5k for some anonymous hitman to kill me, and now he's arrived, send an officer ASAP please and thank you. So I just stayed hiding under my bed, and I still am now. I've been here for an hour now writing this. Think of this as my epitaph. I know I'm screwed. Just a minute ago I heard my back door slowly creak open. This piece of writing may seem humorous to you, the reader, but in reality as you read this I'm under my bed praying to a god that lost all faith in me years ago to spare me to let me go. But I know that won't happen. My bedroom door just opened and I can see a big pair of black boots. I cracked into the dark web. I'd learned to code when I was about 14, 
Now I'm 21. So yes, I've been doing this a long time. I actually work coding for a pharmaceutical conglomerate. During my off hours, I break through essentially unbreakable websites just to prove to myself I can do it. A sleuth without the job title. A cyber sleuth. This day, however, I went further. Not into the deep web. Anyone who has taken a computer basics course in fifth grade could get into and peruse that place. The deep web encompasses 90% of the overall internet, which are nothing more than just sites which aren't indexed. I'm talking about the dark web. That 5% of the internet full of drugs, credit card thieves, arms dealers, and s traffickers. I cracked into it with a Tor browser, and because Tor automatically has JavaScript turned off, you get no ads. It's pretty convenient. The first few sites I browsed were nothing to rave about. I found one site which sold loafers stuffed with taxidermied small birds inside. I don't know what that was about. Anyways, as I began scrolling through different pages, I was only getting websites which looked like they'd been discarded for decades. I began to think that this dark place was merely nothing more than a virtual garbage dump. But then I kept going. Deeper down the dirt path. I came across a site with a large gold coin. The graphic would just keep spinning. Underneath there was a phrase, what is the answer to 99 out of 100 questions? Money. I knew it was a credit card fraud scam site, so I just kept going. Next was a site of nothing but full screen running video of a bedroom. I watched for a good 20 minutes. I saw an old woman of maybe 70 enter the room, shut the door, and begin changing clothes. Gross. Off to the next one. One thing to be known about the dark web is that, though a haven of anonymity, the federal government actually can trace information to servers if you happen to stumble into one of their fake pages. Most notably sites which offer illegal drugs or money laundering schemes, the government creates these clandestine sites so they can catch fish, or simply put, catch you. Passing through, a large majority of spaces were, in fact, sites which push narcotics. Ignored. Not today, boys. A few more sites down the chain I saw something especially upsetting. A pig pen. On one end, a frightened golden retriever. On the other, being pulled by two men, a mountain lion, which was extremely aggressive, trying to tear itself off the leash. The dog was cowering on the other end. Standing around the cage were cackling men in suits placing bets. I'd seen enough. I couldn't bear to see any sort of cruelty to animals. I was beginning to feel that this place is just not for me. It's more than disquieting at this point. Something just feels wrong. I shouldn't be here, but I can't look away. It just kept getting worse. I found a site. Very vintage, with archaic graphics, like something a desperate parent would put up with very drab text underneath a photo of their missing child. Only this page had a rainbow, which said above it, Pedophiles are people too. Jesus Christ, get it the F away from me. I'm going to end up arrested, I thought to myself. And then finally, I made it to a corner. A space all the way at the end. The very last site. Maybe not the last, but alas, a site I could not navigate past. The entire page was a dark, deep blue. It contained an elegant, classy golden rectangular border around the screen, and in gold cursive, looking like a book cover from the 19th century, it read, Novella Black. Trapped. So I'm stuck in this vacuum. This space which will now not allow me to browse beyond or backwards. I turned up my speakers. Nothing. I was convinced my computer was frozen, or had gotten some horrible virus. My assumption as to why I was stuck on this particular page. I tried moving the mouse around. I no longer had a scrolling arrow. Then, after eight minutes, like some morbid, full-screen gif, the novella black title page, for just a blink of an eye, flickered and almost subliminally, I witnessed the black and white image of what looked like a woman with her mouth opened, almost like a yawn and her pupils were rolled up almost all the way to the back of her head. I could only see a sliver of the bottom rim of the eyes. And that was it. A flicker. A cigarette burned into my eyes of a yawning, or maybe screaming, girl with long dark hair. It was unsettling to say the least. This twitch imprint alerted me that I, in fact, was still on this site. My screen wasn't frozen. Before my eyes. The golden cursive text of the page slowly faded into words I couldn't understand a loho embark lock. 
I type the letters into Google in my iPhone. It reads, God bless you in ancient Aramaic. This then dimmed into a purely black screen with a giant keyhole in the center. My scroll arrow appeared on screen, except it wasn't an arrow. It was a key. I'm a tad nervous about what I'm getting myself into, but I've been waiting for this. I scroll to the keyhole with the key and left click. A box popped up in the center of the screen. Are you sure? Fade into keyhole and key. I click it again. A box. Are you positive? I click once more. The screen goes black, but reappears with a strange symbol. It's the Star of David. Two of them, one atop the other, points poking out of the corners of the one below, making for a total of 12 points, all in a dark gray. It's so subtle that your eyes almost have to adjust to fully see it. Then a voice. The voice of a man. I don't have an acute ear for accents. I can only speculate that the language I was hearing was of Middle Eastern dialect. The language was indecipherable. The recording was also very full of static, like it had been recorded on some decades old tape recorder. He was speaking at a very rapid pace. At points he would stop, almost as if he's turning a page and reading from a script. And on and on it went. Scroll arrow again gone. I thought about just pulling the plug on the computer and letting it reboot, but my curiosity kept me going. I pulled out my phone and went to my audio recorder. I recorded a good 35 minutes until I no longer had any more space to use. Still, I couldn't get off of this peculiar site, so I took my work laptop, hooked the router to my computer, and used a different audio recorder to just relay and record what was being said on the page. I shut off my screen, turned down the volume, and went to sleep. That's when I awoke. I found out that I'd recorded six and a half straight hours of audio. I got out of bed at 6.45 a.m. and turned the volume up. Nothing. Turned on the computer screen. All that was there was, as I described before, a bland, very dated-looking website which said Autonetics Incorporated. I scrolled through the content. Autonetics Inc is just a Michigan-based sheet glass manufacturer. I was able to work my way back up to the surface web, the web which everyone begins on, which contains Google. I rebooted my PC, saved the audio file on my work laptop, and went to work. Later on while at work, I emailed the linguistics department of my college, asking if they could possibly help me translate something for what I explained to be a school project. I also detailed the length of the recording, which turned out to be four and a half hours, but that I just needed to know a little bit of the context and also the language behind it. After a few days, I received an email from a woman named Janice Cruz, assistant head of linguistics, telling me she received my file. She assured me that she would take a stab at it when she gets some free time. Several more days pass. Then another email, which read, I've reviewed quite a bit of this file you've sent. It would be best that you call me on this matter. Any weekday after 3 p.m. on my office phone, listed below. And so the conversation went. Janice Cruz. Oh, hi, Janice. This is Travis. I'm the one who sent. Oh, yes, yes. Glad you called. Travis, thanks for looking into this for me. Janice. No problem. So, yes, I looked into it. Actually, I started thinking I'd only be on the hook for maybe five minutes, but this thing kept my attention for quite some time. As a matter of fact, I listened through all of it. Travis. Oh wow, you didn't have to. I'm sorry, maybe I didn't make it clear. I just wanted to know. Janice. Oh no, you've made it clear. But first, I have to ask you, is this a practical joke? If it is, then you got me. But I really need to know. Travis. Joke? Oh no, not at all. Janice, how did you come across this? Travis, I, well, I stumbled upon this site. Did you find out what it was and what the content is? Janice, um, well, the language is Arabic, as for the content. So, where again did you come across this? Travis, the truth is, I work in coding. In my off hours, I tend to break into encrypted sites. I guess I kinda just went down the rabbit hole one night. I ended up inside the dark web using a Tor browser. I stumbled upon this strange site called Novella Black. Janice. Hmm, I see. Well, I'm just going to be honest with you. At first, there was a lot of talk about astronomy. But a little while into it, 
the speaker began spouting anti-Semitic jargon and propaganda. It was really vile. Then it was mostly incantations in 6th century BC Aramaic, which then switched back to modern Arabic. Travis. Whoa. Okay. Uh. Janus. The majority of the rest of it were very thoughtfully, precisely planned out attacks. Precision down to exact coordinates. Coordinates inside of Israel. Travis. What? Janus. Places which are to be bombing targets in the very near future. And you said you got this all out of a website? Travis. Yes, it was just a website. I hacked my way into it. Janus. Where are you right now? Travis. I'm on my way home. Janus. Okay. I could hear a voice coming through what sounded like another phone. I heard her, obviously holding the phone far from my ears, say, he's on his way home now. Janus, what road or street are you on right now? I already knew the situation. I felt like I was falling inside. I quickly hung up the phone. Instead of heading home, I went to a bar about ten blocks from my house. I needed a drink. Thank God I'm twenty-one. But they found me. Within five minutes I was in handcuffs and on my way to the station. But first, they took me to my apartment, where they confiscated my computer. They interrogated me for two hours, one a detective and the other a young cadet, riding on a pad as I spoke. Two hours while a trained computer programmer sifted through my history. Novella Black. There it was. The officers got a look at it. We sat around and waited until the keyhole appeared. He opened up the page and saw that everything I'd been saying all along was the truth. During the interrogation, they spoke to me only about one tiny kernel in that four-hour amalgam of Jewish hatred. While naming a list of terrorist plots, one piece that was mentioned was a synagogue. Not just any, but Baron Hirsch Synagogue, which seats up to 3,000 people in Memphis, Tennessee. It was clearly explained that the biggest Jewish place of worship in the U.S. was going to be bombed on April 12th of this year. I was released without charges and went home. I couldn't believe it. Why? Why would Palestinian radicals so explicitly state anywhere on the internet the exact place and date of an attack? I thought attacks were supposed to be secret, sitting on razors. For weeks, I sat absolutely terrified about this planned attack. It was not even a week away. On the night of the 5th, I came home, made myself a rum and coke, and flicked on the TV. And to my horror. There it was. Breaking news on every channel. Baron Hirsch Synagogue. Half of the structure collapsed, people fleeing, screaming, and fires raging. Helicopters circling. We don't have exact numbers yet, but authorities have informed us that at least 300 have died when two men entered from the West End during mass and set off explosives, killing themselves in the process. The news anchor obviously speaking under duress. Now I understand. It was disinformation all along. How clever and evil it made perfect sense. Set up a site in the dark web where they know the feds will be looking and create a campaign of unreliable disinformation, a morose game of chess. And I was directly in the middle of it. That day, I was brought back to the station once more and questioned one last time. They checked my phone records, texts, and emails. They searched my work laptop and iPhone. I was set free almost 24 hours later after having spoken with the FBI. I tell myself that this would have occurred whether I stumbled upon Novella Black or not. I am so absolutely shook from this experience. I have nightmares of being trapped inside of my basement apartment, with a fire raging above, the smoke creeping down to me as I suffocate slowly, waiting for the flames to make it this way and take me out forever. Sometimes I see the faces of those people on TV boiling in a flame-fueled lake of gasoline, unable to escape and unable to die. Other times I see that graphic, that face, the woman with the gaping mouth. I still can't explain that, and I don't wish to research it. In the end, 351 people were slaughtered that day. And you know exactly where I will never go again. Thanks for listening. If you like our work, do subscribe because your support helps us keep this channel alive.